created the universe to him belong the heavens and the earth the ever living he is the first he's the owner of mercy he sent his messengers to warn his creatures of the great danger السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله الملك الحق المبين وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله المبعوث رحمة للعالمين We welcome everyone back to this which will be in شاء الله our final episode in this series of talks The Prince of Piety Lessons from the story of Musa عليه السلام In the past 32 verses we've discussed how Allah سبحانه وتعالى has granted Musa alayhi salam a excellent upbringing, the best upbringing under the sight and care of Allah Azza wa Jal himself. He allotted him a special care and he protected him with a special kind of protection. فَاللَّهُ خَيْرٌ حَافِظًا وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّحِيمِينَ For Allah is the best guardian, as Yaqub alayhi salam said when he lost his son Yusuf at the plot of his brothers, and he is the most merciful, more than any of those that ever show mercy, he said. And we see that, that Musa alayhi salam's mother was a believer, but she was not able to protect him. And Fir'aun was the safest place for him to be, though we did not understand that, but he could not offer him a proper upbringing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him away from his mother alayhi salatu wasalam, as an infant, and he sent him to the doorstep of Fir'aun, so that Fir'aun could adopt him as a child. For his deficiency was that he could not have children. So he consented for his wife to keep him. Yet Musa alayhi salam was not going to survive because he refused to drink any milk. This of course is summarizing everything we've stood at of the events. So they brought him back to his mother. So he was cared for and his mother was cared for and she was spent on with a stipend from Fir'aun and she would nurse him the milk and the iman together and so he was raised as a prince, an adopted prince among the people of Fir'aun but he was raised and cultured and nourished as a believer, an amazing believer at the hands of this amazing mother who raised her son that way and her daughter that way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with the mother of Musa alayhi salam and may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon his prophet and messenger whom he spoke to directly, Kalimullah, Musa alayhi salam. And I wish to take a few final lessons from this, a few more practical lessons as a review and perhaps to highlight the things of greatest importance for us with regards to this series of talks. The first of them, as we just said, is that Musa alayhi salam, his upbringing was not out of thin air. It was not out of thin air. Rather, Allah azza wa jal set it up so that his mother, who was a believing mother, could raise him and instill in him the values of the believers and to connect him with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, th and this is the way that it has to be, that we need to put ourselves in an environment, if we're talking about ourselves, or put our children in an environment so that they can flourish. Iman must plant it in its proper soil, and that's why the Prophet ﷺ said it straight out. لا تصاحب إلا مؤمنة. Do not keep the company except of the believers. You can interact with whoever you want, whenever there is a need to do so. But know that you will be affected with those that you are with to the degree that you are with them. So make sure the majority of your company is the company of the believers, and the believers that are better than you. You try your best to find those that are better than you. And I say very quickly, though this is a wide subject, that good company is so much better than being alone because it motivates you. But being alone is better than bad company. So even if you cannot find this good company we're speaking about, so that they're contagious, Iman, you can catch it, and it could be the best thing that ever happened to you, then be alone and find even better friends in that privacy. How? By re reading the likes of the stories of the prophets and the stories of the companions, for they were the ideal believers. They were the exemplars when it came to Iman and conviction and righteousness and abiding by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance throughout. So there must be an environment wherein a person's Iman will flourish. He must not have these rosy dreams and this wishful thinking that I'm just going to be and I will and I will and I will. Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah says something very beautiful about this concept of empty wishes or just being hopeful in, to a degree that is delusional, not just assuming the best of Allah. Assuming the best of Allah entails, you're going to go out looking for what is available to you that Allah has destined for you to find of help. But a person, when he has these delusional wishes, 
and he continues to procrastinate in finding the means that will help him, he says, know that this is the Achilles heel of all the human beings. Shaitan has tricked human beings with different things, but he has tricked everyone alike with this procrastination in which you bury your opportunities. Procrastination, delaying, and wishful thinking, this is the grave in which we bury our opportunities. So your opportunity to be like of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it be lesser degree, of course, we're not going to be prophets, is for you to try your very best to find good company and not sit back and think that you can be without following the same steps that they followed. The next lesson is that Musa alayhi salam had an exceptional infancy. And that exceptional infancy was obvious, that he survived in the river, not drowning in it. And despite him being picked up out of the river by the ones he was thrown in the river to flee from or to be protected from. And all the greats that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made into extraordinary, phenomenal human beings have had early signs with regards to that. Look at Musa alayhi salam in the story that we've discussed. Move forward, look at Isa alayhi salatu was salam. There was an exceptional sign in his infancy. And what was that? The hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari of Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala an. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ma min mawludin illa wa yastahillu sarikha. There is no newborn except that he comes out screaming. When he's born, he begins to cry. And this is until he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, illa Maryam wa binaha. Except Maryam alayhi wa sallam and her son. Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, the narrator of the hadith, explains why after the hadith and he says اقرأوا إن شئتم recite the words of Allah if you wish meaning for an explanation وإني أعيذها بك وذريتها من الشيطان الرجيم سورة آل عمران the mother of Maryam عليه السلام said oh Allah I seek protection for her and her offspring from cursed shaytan meaning Maryam عليه السلام and her offspring Isa عليه الصلاة والسلام their mother the mother of Maryam and the grandmother of Isa عليه الصلاة والسلام sought protection with Allah for Maryam and for her son from the accursed shaitan. And that is why they did not come out of the stomach of their mother screaming. Because he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the hadith, I left the last part out. There is no child except that he comes out of his mother's womb. He comes down screaming. This is because shaitan stabs him. Meaning shaitan has not spoiled Isa Alaihi Wasallam. Absolutely not. Rather, what this means that shaitan declares his enmity to every human being from the very first moment. And Isa alayhi salatu wasalam and his mother were an exception to that. So this is an exceptional incident in the infancy. So these are signs for these prophets that they were exceptional human beings from very early. So what does that have to do with us? This also has something to do with us. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places signs and gifts in his creation even after the prophets. Even if it be lesser a degree, but we have to study these things. Be at least alert to these things. Look for them. The early Muslims learned this from the stories of the prophets and they would do just that. They used to ask them, how do you know that your child is an exceptional child? They say we would listen as he is playing with his friends. If, if he says to his friends, who is with me? We know he's fit to be a leader. He was created by Allah to be a leader. And if he says to his friends, I'm with who? Who's team am on? then we know he is a regular human being. The point of reference is that a person must study their child or even study themselves to see what has Allah Azza wa Jal made available to them. If you want to know, as they say, your status with Allah, then let yourself consider where has Allah stationed you. Where he stationed you equals your status in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, your child, see if Allah has given him something. He's not going to be a prophet and messenger. That's clear. But see if Allah has given him something and don't allow that to die off. Recognize it and act upon it. Benefit the ummah with it. This is an opportunity to learn from the story of Musa alayhi salam that there are signs that Allah grants early. You know, even non-Muslim psychologists, they mention that most children's talents are buried by the time they're seven or eight, I believe they said, to the degree that 90% of their talents never actualize, never come into being because they're not recognized early. We don't give our children the time of day. We say, study your children and don't let, don't let the opportunity pass because shaitan will study them and he will try very hard to let the opportunity pass. Number four is, as we said, the aqidah, the proper belief system, which is the groundwork for everything else, for being an exceptional human being, is not just taught on an academic level. We said that Musa alayhi salam was returned to his mother so he may learn from her iman and he may be a believer that way she was a believer. And then, 
that we granted him authority and knowledge and thus we give to the people of Ihsan. So this is the second way to establish that aqidah because knowledge of the most important knowledge is knowledge of Allah and how we believe about Allah. So the second way to learn knowledge is to act upon the bit that you've learned. When you act upon that which you learn, Allah teaches you that which you didn't. And when you don't act upon that which you learn, you become blind to that which you know. So it's as if this knowledge that comes in front of you about Allah and His religion, it's in front of your eyes immediately. You see it, there it is. It's an option for you. It's an availability for you. It is there, your opportunity to act upon it. If you don't act upon it, you will be carrying it to others. As the verse says, like a donkey carries books. You will be delivering that knowledge to others, but it will be weighing you down. You will be blind to it, meaning its impact will not exist in your life. So that's the second way that the aqidah is established. Number one is to learn it. We have to study it, of course. But if we're going to spend our whole lives studying it, then when in the world are we ever going to benefit from it in the practical sense, knowledge and actions. Once you act upon it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establishes that knowledge for you and keeps it real inside of you and it does not wither away, it does not become information, it does not become just empty facts. And that's why Abu Sulaiman al-Darani rahimahullah remember this statement of his. He was told, بِمَا تُنَالُ مَعْرِفَةُ Allah. How does someone get to the degree of knowing Allah? Aqeedah. Becoming acquainted with Allah. قَالَ بِطَاعَتِهِ He said by obeying Him. They said, and how can a person get to the degree of obeying Him? قَالَ بِهِ He said through Him. What does that mean? Think about it for a few minutes until we return after the break, inshaAllah Azza wa Jal. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa wa ba'd. In the name of Allah, all praise and glory belongs to Allah and may His finest peace and blessings be upon the Messenger of Allah Muhammad and His family and His companions and all those loyal to Him. Welcome back. We said that the correct way to instill a true, powerful, effective conviction or aqeedah inside of someone, as we learned from the story of Musa alayhi salam, was number one, to actually learn it. And he learned it from his mother. Two is to act upon the knowledge that you have so that your knowledge will be effective and you will not become numb to it and blind to it. We left with the statement of Abu Sulaiman al-Darani rahimahullah when he was asked, how does someone become acquainted with Allah? He said, by obeying him. He said, and how does one reach the level of obeying him? He said, through him. Meaning a person is to reach obeying Allah by seeking Allah's help. So when you seek Allah's help, you are able to obey Him, act upon your knowledge. And when you act upon your knowledge, only then will you be someone that knows Him. Because someone that has knowledge of the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could be a non-Muslim. And he could tell you what the 99 names are. He got them from the internet and he memorized them and he read them to you. But he does not know Allah, does not have a beneficial effect in his life, is not consequential to him. Why? Because he refused to obey Him. So when a person disbelieves or a person commits a sin, this stamps a black dot on their heart. And the more black dots a person has in their heart, the blinder, the more diseased that heart is. And it cannot recognize the knowledge. That knowledge to them is a facade. It's just an image. It is not real knowledge. It is not a driving force that lifts them and propels them. So a person is number one, to learn his proper belief system, his proper creed and his theology. Number two, he is to act upon it to the best of his ability so that Allah Azza may keep it there for him and he does not become blurred in his vision, the vision of his heart regarding it. Number three of the ways to learn the proper conviction regarding Allah, the proper Iman, the proper faith, is to learn it practically. And our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would teach Aqeedah in this very manner. He would teach it practically, number one, in everyday life, and number two, he would do so Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when difficulties arose. So in his everyday life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would take the children and he would tell them, for example, that only Allah Azza wa Jal possesses benefit and harm for you. Like the hadith of Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala an. And Sunan al-Tirmidhi narrated by Ahmad as well. He took Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. And Ibn Abbas, by the time the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died, he said, I was on the verge of passing puberty. So you can imagine a person learning aqidah at such a young age, even before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had died, he told him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Oh young man, I'm going to teach you some words, so remember them. And even notice how it is here. I'm going to teach you some words, it's bracing him to pay attention to these words. Not just in passing, hey you, fear Allah, that's haram. No, listen to me. Ihfadillah yahfad. Safeguard Allah will safeguard you. Ihfadillah tajidhu tujahad. Safeguard Allah, you're going to find him in front of you. He's going to direct you everywhere you need to go. He will direct you and guide you aright. When you ask, ask of Allah. When you seek help, seek help from Allah. And know that if the entire world gets together to benefit you in any way, they will not benefit you in any way, except in a way that Allah already has written for you. 
And if they come together to harm you in any way, they will not harm you in any way except in a way that Allah already has written against you. Can you imagine these profound words being taught in everyday life to a young man of that age? He sallallahu alayhi wa would instill that in the children in everyday life, not just sitting there in an academic fashion. He would grab people and tell them, do you know why this happened? And connect them to recognize Allah Azza wa Jal's effect on the world. In the hadith in Sahih Muslim of Abu Dhar radiallahu ta'ala an, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa asked it as a question. He said, O oh Abu Dhar, atadri ayna dhahabat al-shams? Do you know Abu Dhar where the sun went? So he said, Allah and his messenger know best. We all know it always sets in that same place. It's set in the west. Came up from the east and it's set in the west. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, ذَهَبَتْ لِتَسْجُدَ تَحْتَ الْعَرْشِ It went to prostrate under the throne of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. How? Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. But he said so, so it's true, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, and then it seeks permission from Allah, meaning every time after it sets, it makes sujood under the throne of Allah, and it seeks permission from Allah to rise again, meaning from the east. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, until one day there will come when it will seek permission and Allah Azza wa Jal will tell it, go back from where you came. Meaning don't come out from the east, come out from the west. And that is the hour. The hour is when the sun rises from the west as he told us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So notice how he is connecting his Sahaba in everyday life, the world around them. He's connecting them with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. This practical instruction and education with regards to Aqeedah, this is key. And then we learn from the story of Musa Alayhi Salam that Aqeedah is taught through those difficult moments in your life. Allah Azza wa Jal allows you to mature spiritually. We call it spiritual maturity, if you remember. That through these events and through these incidents, Allah Azza wa Jal brings you closer to Him. Were it not for these incidents, perhaps you would never have recognized. Perhaps you would have strayed a bit in your understanding. And so Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala teaches us in the most difficult moments that it is He that is worthy of being trusted. So we are to see that as an opportunity for leaps and bounds in our relationship with Allah and in our determination as productive human beings, these difficulties in our lives. Allah sends them our way to teach us about Him. And that's the most beneficial knowledge you can have. Look at all the ways that we are to learn our aqidah. Learn that from the story of Musa alayhi salam and never lose sight of it. Musa alayhi salam was one through one incident and the next and exiled from Egypt and the likes and he was lost. And so Allah sent him towards the tree to find guidance for all of us, not just for himself and his wife in the middle of the desert. The same thing with our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Muhammad. In the most difficult of moments, in that hijrah, when they were chased out of Mecca, he and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu are running and behind them is Suraq ibn Malik. Suraq ibn Malik is chasing them on a horse. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is, O oh, Messenger of Allah, he's gaining on us. O oh, Messenger of Allah, he's coming close. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do not worry. Do not worry. And he, with his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the hind legs of the horse of Suraqa fall into the sand and he becomes stranded by that and he cannot reach them. This was in that same incident that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was in the cave with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He told the Messenger of Allah, they're right there, they can see us. He said, Abu Bakr, what is your assumption? Notice how he's wording it in questions many times. He wants you to actively think because when you don't think, this is what kills your devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thinking is key. Thinking is an act of worship. And we have to fight that urge to simply take things for granted. The sun comes up, it's always going to come up. These people see us means they're going to find us. He said, oh Abu Bakr, think of it differently. Oh Abu Bakr, what do you think of two when Allah is their third? لا تحزن إن الله معنا. Do not grieve. Indeed, Allah Azza wa Jal is with us. So these are the ways that we learn, even through the difficult moments, how to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever actually does so, that's up to them. And whomever does not do so, then that is up to them. Let the first thank Allah for the opportunity and benefit from it, and let the second only blame himself. Finally, of the important lessons that we are to take from the story of Musa alayhi salam is that he was of the people of Ihsan, and Allah Azza wa loves the people of Ihsan. And he grants the people of Ihsan a greater reward than just anyone else, not even just the believers, because Ihsan, we said, is a higher degree than a believer that does everything he's supposed to do. The person of Ihsan, the person of excellence, does even more than what he's supposed to be doing. He maxes out for Allah. And that can only be when you learn the proper aqidah, when you recognize Allah and you focus on Him. And that's why he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was asked what ihsan is, he said to worship Allah as though you see Him. And if you cannot see Him, then He sees you. This is what ihsan is. When you recognize Allah azza wa jal and you realize who He is, you do above and beyond the obligatory. And thus, as we said, you get above and beyond the reward. Allah Azza wa Jal says, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا الْحُسْنَى 
وزياده to those that do excellence do ihsan for them is ihsan the most excellent reward in paradise وزياده and even more meaning the opportunity to look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's face without end in jannah of course this is a reward beyond every reward even beyond jannah itself so when a person recognizes Allah and maxes out even beyond the obligatory because he's so lost in his adoration of Allah and so lost in an awe of Allah and his greatness and so lost in his hope of what Allah can grant him the unlimited treasures and so lost in his fear of Allah not wanting to jeopardize his relationship with Allah this is when we climb that that ladder and part of recognizing Allah we said is to recognize the rights of the creation and of the signs that Allah loves you and Allah has granted you iman and is bringing you up that ladder towards ihsan is that you are gentle with his creation and you are kind with his creation and that's why he also said sallallahu alayhi wasallam inna allah ta'ala katab al-ihsan ala kulli shay indeed allah azza wa jal has written ihsan kindness excellence meaning in dealing with the creation in this context because you will see why from the rest of the hadith he has written kindness upon everything so whomever of you kills fal yuhsin al-qitl let them show excellence kindness even in the way that they kill meaning when a person kills an animal a vermin a bug he's not to torture it he kills it flawlessly even if we are going to say that this is referring to the guidance of the battlefield there is nothing to be ashamed of because islam does not promote bloodshed rather islam gave us guidelines for an inevitable reality about our lives that we are not allowed to torture in islam the way so many nations nowadays around the world torture that if there exists a battle he said do not fight and do not kill unless it is in the best fashion and then he continued saying that it doesn't even apply to humans it even applies to animals the hadith continues and says and when one of you slaughters then let them show ihsan kindness in the way they slaughter and then he gave an example of how sallallahu alayhi wasallam he said wal yuhidda ahadukum shafratahu wal yurih dhabihata and let one of you sharpen his blade meaning so it's quick and painless that sheep or that lamb or that cow or otherwise that you slaughter let them sharpen their blade and let them put their animal to rest so when a person recognizes allah and is kind with his creation Allah opens the doors of opportunity for him in this world with leadership and knowledge and in the next of being of the highest levels of jannah may Allah azza wa grant us and you that say amen when he said sallallahu alaihi wasallam when you ask Allah you ask him for the highest levels the highest levels is al-firdaus he said ask him for al-firdaus al-a'la the highest level al-firdaus for that is the center of paradise he said and that is the heights of paradise and out of its spring the rivers of paradise and its ceiling is the throne of ar-rahman is the throne of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so firstly we begin by asking allah to gather us and you at the end of this series in al-firdaus al-a'la allahumma amin and then to grant us the ability through this series to climb that ladder of ihsan so that we can qualify for al-firdaus al-a'la allahumma amin and we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just as he's gathered us in this dunya upon the best of terms he gathers us and you on the best of terms in this world and the next and that he make what we've heard here and what we've learned from here beneficial to the speaker and the listener alike and to make the generations that come out better than the generations that exist today and make them all a blessing upon the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allahumma ameen jazakallahu khairan everyone for attentive listening wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen